Hi, Stephen. Welcome to the Brighton Art Gallery. Um, I want to just ask you a bit about the commission you did here. When you're asked to come to somewhere like Brighton to do a series of photos, how on earth do you start? The first thing you're trying to do is shake off what you already know or what you think you know based on maybe pictures or small visits you've had. I think that was the toughest thing for me, shaking that off, completely uh, zeroing your mind. And I guess I've had the luxury of being able over the past 10 years or so just to feel compelled to make a body of work. And make, but this was to make a body of work in a certain place within a certain time parameters. Um, for the people of Brighton, made in Brighton. So at first I was thinking a lot about that and they were all quite detached ideas because I don't know Brighton, I don't really know many people here. So I didn't want, definitely didn't want to come and do a body of work that said, this is Brighton. I, I think I just simply wouldn't be able to do that. because I, So it, I, ha I knew it was going to be a series where I was stepping back mm -hmm. and trying to be steered by the place in some way. Tell us a bit about this, you talk about the baggage of your previous knowledge. Yeah. Can you just talk about that well, a bit? Well, I think there is national and regional visual, the place, places that are visually represented. And I think often these things are inherited and carry over for years and years and years. It doesn't necessarily mean that is marries with a place at all. Sometimes I think these things are in place to give echoes of the past, but it doesn't. So often I think we, can look for how we imagine places to be versus how they are, sort of, you know, London being Big Ben, Red Buses, Harrods and Punks and Seasides, Punch and Judy's, Bingo. So it's like, I think I think I was def really wanted to shake off that and just be open and start from zero. And can you explain, therefore, what you ended up doing? Just uh, allowing the place to try and speak for itself and really try and extract what a place feels like. And in the case of the Brighton series, I decided to kind of literally scoop up and collect particles, objects, pressed and um, dried plants, seed life, insects, and really try and invite Brighton in. So it's Brighton in Brighton. Um, so it's Brighton within your camera? Yeah, and so using the camera as a kind of Rather than a descriptive tool, I was almost looking at it as more of a hoover, just sucking at Brighton, literally trying to encapsulate Brighton within itself. So I, I see from the photos, you, you've literally taken things just from the beach or from all of Brighton? Um, no, it's all of Brighton, and I've just been collecting all sorts of objects, often from the vicinity where I was making work, sometimes just collecting them, putting them in the camera, that I felt would marry with what I was photographing. Because you even put in uh, things like ants and small crabs, is that right? That's right, yeah, sort of creatures and... And these were alive? Yeah, so whatever you're putting in the camera, in the case of insects or small animals, they're sort of walking across the film emulsion as the shutter opens and closes. With the objects sitting on the emulsion with a lensless process, you get this absolutely amazing clarity. So even sort of the hairs on an ant's leg or then you can play with that and dial the lens itself out of focus. So in one image, the, the picture's pulling in so many different directions because scale is completely out the window. Even one of the first things I did here is buy a fishing rod when I was fishing and catching quite a lot of mackerel. There's a lot of mackerel here at the moment. And even they ended up in the camera. I was Could you actually get a, a mackerel? Though? It's very bigger, much bigger than it's the quite camera. A big fish. Could you put it in the camera? Um, well, like, what I did is barbecued it first, cut off the tail, put the bones in the camera. So there's these translucent mackerel bones. So I love the idea of sort of pulling the subject out of the sea. I know you've got the camera with you. Can you just show us uh, yeah. so you can explain? Uh, I mean, the film is running along here. Isn't yeah, it? the film plane is here. Um, so in order to have objects and things lying on top of the film emulsion, that's literally the way you have. So, you're f so I've created this m mirror device with this front face, really high quality mirror. Um, so, and in between frames, you'd sort of rock the camera if there's, <laughs> and shake it quite hard if there's no living creatures in there. There was even one occasion where I, I had the camera back open, I was loading the camera, and a fly actually flew into the camera, um, which was probably one of the most exciting parts of the series. So it felt like the word had got around in the insect world. You, you have to remember, because when you're adding things to the camera, you're obscuring as much as you are adding. So you, 
mentally you're sort of leaning or composing an image, but the very core or key part of the picture may be obscured. You're steering the work, but you also have no idea where the pictures are going to land. So you've got the camera, you've put these objects in, what is it then that you actually take the photographs of to, um, to couple with the objects in your camera? It went off in so many different directions to the point where I was even asking members of the public if they would like to add their own elements from my selection of elements to the portrait I was about to take of them. At first I was restricted, as you mentioned, by size. Um, and later I thought, actually, there shouldn't be any reason why I am restricted by size. You could even put a double-decker bus in the camera. So what I did in order to do that is start working on E6 slide film, photographing things and subjects that I was interested in but couldn't squeeze in the camera, process the film, cut them out, so they too, so bigger objects could find their way in. You, you must have had hundreds of these photographs. What yeah. sort of criteria did you use to try and select the ones for the um, exhibition? The pictures that worked for me were slightly, there's, an, there's a harmony but there's also something bit of a blip or a bit of tension as well. So you spent three or four weeks uh, walking around, cycling around, shooting the pictures here. What do you think you've learned about Brighton this time? I think the things that I've noticed are silly things like there's enormous amounts of tattoos in Brighton and some particularly good ones. I think that's what I've noticed, but that's probably because I was photographing during the summer months. Pink is probably one of the favourite colours or colour that I would associate with Brighton. There's a lot of carpet shops and hoover shops, really big in Brighton. It, it's amazing how you realise how restricted you are with straight photographing. And once you start to open this tiny door, it can go in all sorts of directions. And the weird thing was, after, when working like this intensely for five or six weeks, then I went to make work with a normal camera back in London. And it was so, it was like where you're, it's like when you go ice skating or rare roller skates for a day and you suddenly take your skates off and start walking. You, it, it's strange how quickly you get to know that way of working. I really I enjoyed that very much. Well, we've enjoyed your work. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you.